Hello, my name is Dr. Heather Lau. I'm the director of the Lysosomal Storage Disorders Program at NYU Langone Health. Today I'll be talking about the impact of Gaucher disease on our pediatric patients with a focus on bone and growth. I will speak a little bit about the Gaucher disease itself, the cause and the manifestations, as well as the specific implications in our pediatric population, and then go on to talk about how we can prevent and treat Gaucher disease in both our adult and pediatric population. Gaucher disease is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder that leads to the deficiency of a specific enzyme called glucoserebrosidase. Glucoserebrosidase is an important protein that helps break down this specific lipid molecule called glucosyl ceramide into its components of glucose and ceramide. If you can imagine, when you're deficient in a protein, that leads to the accumulation of this specific lipid. And this lipid starts to fill up the cell and cause dysfunction. The specific cell that's affected in Gaucher disease is the macrophage. And when it becomes filled up with that storage, it starts to transform into the Gaucher cell. That Gaucher cell then goes on to infiltrate throughout the body. It can infiltrate the liver and enlarge the liver, infiltrate the spleen, causing splenic enlargement, and further sequestration of platelets. It can infiltrate the bone marrow, where it can suppress blood cell production. The bone marrow is critical for your white blood cell, red blood cell, and platelet production. In Gaucher disease specifically, we have a reduction in our platelets. Platelets are really important in controlling bleeding. The Gaucher cell can also infiltrate the bone marrow, where there's the production of blood cells, including white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. In particular, we often see a reduction in platelets due to this bone marrow infiltration. In addition to infiltrating the inside of the bone, it can actually infiltrate the bone itself and impact the thickness of the bone, called bone density, as well as the growth of the bone in the linear length, leading to short stature and growth retardation. Separately, it can actually lead to bone lesions, including bone infarcts, or strokes of the bone, and avascular necrosis, or death of the bone, which are irreversible bone complications. These manifest as episodes of bone pain and bone crises. Bone pain is typically a mild to moderate pain deep inside the bones that is transient and goes away. The more severe crises may prompt the patient to seek help in the emergency room. It might be associated with a fever, an elevation in white count, and changes on x-ray, leading to irreversible bone damage again. So as you can see, Gaucher cells manifest and penetrate throughout the body. Not all patients exhibit all signs and symptoms of Gaucher disease. There are different mutations that lead to different severities of Gaucher disease. And historically, there was one particular uh, genotype that was considered mild. It was known as N370S homozygous, which means that both copies of that gene that's affected, the GBA gene, carried this change. And in that case, you would have Gaucher type 1, and you'd be considered mild. They thought that the onset of disease would be later in life, in adulthood, or maybe even asymptomatic. However, when we start to look back at our patients, all the way back to childhood, we see that the N370S homozygous state has a wide range of severity. Children can present as early as age two with this mild phenotype, genotype. And they might not, um, there's a difference even within families of uh, disease burden and age of onset. So what does this mean for our children? When children are being identified as having Gaucher disease, they were historically told to not worry about their disease until they're older. And sometimes these children would not be monitored by an expert in Gaucher disease. Or they might be monitored locally through assessments of their blood counts. 
but they would not go further than that. They would not look for the bone complications. So parents were falsely reassured by their pediatricians that by simply checking their blood counts or even palpating their abdomen, that if they didn't have significant enlargement of the spleen or significant low platelets or bleeding issues, their disease was mild and did not need treatment. However, we now know that there's hidden bone complications. In a retrospective review of a, a large population of pediatric patients, over 887 patients, we see that in addition to hepatosplenomegaly, enlargement of their liver and spleen in over 80%, up to 80% also had radiologic bone complications. Findings on x-rays that they had Gaucher disease. Up to a third had growth retardation, which is defined as less than fifth percentile for their age and their sex. Over 60% we're actually under the 25th percentile for growth. So over 60% of our children are already showing either growth delay or restriction in this so-called milder phenotype. In addition, um, up to 27% reported bone pain and 9% reported bone crises, the more severe episodes of pain. And this is in a large cohort of children that were untreated. So as you can imagine, now that we understand this disease better, it's important to intervene early. I can intervene with effective therapies to reduce the liver and the spleen size, to correct the anemia, to correct the low platelets, but I cannot change the irreversible bone damage. So let's look a little bit more at the bone in children. When we think about bone uh, mass, or the thickness of our bones, we start to lay down our bone in childhood. But that continues across to age 30. We deposit most of our bone between age 8 and age 18, reaching peak bone mass by age 30. And that's your bone density, that you'll go on into your 30s and 40s with your bones, hopefully strong. And then as we age, we start to decrease in our bone density more rapidly in postmenopausal women. And that leads to the surveillance for osteopenia and osteoporosis, of which you understand can lead to f increased ri risk of fractures of your spine and your hips. This is in the normal population, the normal development of bone over time. We lose bone later in life. So you can imagine if you're a child with Gaucher and you're entering your teens, your 20s, one or two standard deviations below what you're supposed to be at. We are now leaving our children vulnerable to fractures later in life in a disease that is, can be treated. In addition to that, the growth, the linear growth, the height of our children. We determine height by looking at our parents, and there's a formula that we can predict what our children will grow to be, barring any nutritional factors. But in our patients with Gaucher disease, we see that there's the impact of that enzyme deficiency is on growth velocity. Now, some of our patients will be behind on their growth, and they can catch up. Up to 50% could achieve that normal mid-parental height, that projected height. But some of our patients will not. And I cannot predict which patient will go on to achieve their uh, genetic uh, pre, uh, de predetermined height, and the others that will be short, have short stature. And as we understand with growth, there is this window of opportunity to intervene, and that's puberty and actually before puberty if we want to institute therapy, to start to correct this enzymatic defect, to correct the hypermetabolic state that's associated with Gaucher disease, and to allow our bodies to start to heal and to grow. So how do we treat Gaucher disease in our patients, specifically in our pediatric patients? Well, fortunately, over 20 years ago, they've developed an artificial or synthetic enzyme 
It originally started in placental uh, cells, but now we have the technology to recreate this enzyme in cell lines and to give it back to the patient every two weeks through the IV. This enzyme therapy is dramatically improves the outcomes of our patients. We are able to reverse severe thrombocytopenia. We're able to dramatically decrease the splenomegaly that we see, sometimes up to 25 times normal. And the entire abdomen of these small children, adults, or anyone affected have these protuberant abdomens because they're filled with their organs. We're able to dramatically decrease that size within a couple of years and correct the hematologic abnormalities. So the enzyme replacement therapy, we have three FDA approved enzyme replacement therapies that are equally effective. And once they hit adulthood, we now have the option to offer an oral therapy, which is life changing for many of our patients who have been tied to an enzyme infusion every two weeks. They can now have the freedom to travel and to do things and not have to worry about their every two week enzyme infusion. So this type of therapy is called an oral substrate reduction therapy, of which there are two FDA-approved uh, medicines out there. One of them is actually approved for first-line therapy, which means that you can give it to a patient who's never been on therapy before. So how does this therapy work? It actually turns down the production of that lipid, that, that glucocerebroside, and then uses your own body's enzyme to clear out the storage. And that sounds like that couldn't work, or how could you do that? You don't have enough enzyme. Well, in fact, you don't need a whole lot of enzyme to clear out the storage. You just need to simply decrease the amount of that product being created. And the data has shown it. Over nine years of data showing that patients who started on therapy have never been on any other therapy, decreased their liver and spleen size, corrected their severe, even severe thrombocytopenia in the same time span as enzyme replacement therapy. So within two to three years, achieving the same goals of therapy. And it's been dramatically uh, life-changing for some of my patients. And the longer data, uh, the longer term data is panning out that we are affecting bone as well. So we can help with the bone pain and the bone crises within two to three years of being therapy on therapy. And we can actually start to correct growth if we intervene before puberty, achieving normal growth in some of our patients, and also with our bone density. I had an 18-year-old who came in to my office who had a bone density equivalent to minus two standard deviations, which would be equivalent to osteoporosis. And when we started on therapy, over time, we were able to achieve more bone mass being deposited and normalizing that bone density simply by giving enzyme therapy back. We did not need to give anti-osteoporotic medications that we give our elderly. We simply gave back what they were missing, which was the enzyme. The same thing for growth. If we intervene early, we can help with their uh, growth by simply giving back that enzyme. Some families actually opt not to give the intravenous enzyme replacement therapy if the child's other uh, medical issues are not so severe. They don't have significant low platelets or splenomegaly. And they think that they could correct growth simply by going to the endocrinologist and getting growth hormone. But in fact, they're not correcting the underlying issue here, which is the lack of that enzyme. And when we see and we give back that enzyme, we see correction of growth. So it's important that we target our therapy to our patient and, and choose what is appropriate for each patient and not to offer other therapies that have no role in the treatment of Crochet disease. Of course, when we talk about treatment of Crochet, we also talk about a healthy lifestyle and making sure that children have adequate calcium and vitamin D to help with the building blocks of the bone and regular exercise. And we want to do this before we lose that window of opportunity and we send them off into adulthood with the best bone that they can have. And we can do that now that we have therapy. So Gaucher disease is a highly treatable disease. And if found and treated early, 
we can prevent irreversible bone complications so that our patients can go on to have an active and healthy life.